All right, good afternoon, everybody. TGIF, nice to see you. Do not have any uh, comments at the top, so we can go straight to your questions. Josh, would you, would you like to start? Sure, thanks, Josh. I'd like to start with uh, the White House's efforts to secure a vote in the Senate for uh, the President's Supreme Court nominee. Yeah. Uh, after there had been some signs that some Republicans might be open to hearings, um, we have a new joint op-ed from Senators Grassley and McConnell that um, you know, really are pushing back on that. So I guess my question to you would be the same one I asked you just a few days ago, which is, mm -hmm. are you making headway here? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, Josh, let me start out by telling you that the President in the last uh, 24 hours or so, basically since I last saw you, has begun uh, something that I alluded to yesterday, which is the President will consult a, a wide variety uh, of individuals with a wide variety of perspectives as he contemplates uh, his nominee to fill the vacancy on the Supreme Court. Um, that consultation uh, included, just in the last 24 hours, telephone calls with uh, Leader McConnell, uh, Leader Reid, uh, Chairman Grassley, uh, and Senator Leahy, who is the ranking member on the Senate Judiciary Committee. Obviously, the significance of the call with Senator Grassley is that he's the chairman of the Senate Judiciary Committee. Uh, and this, you know, again, this will be part of, uh, uh, of the President's process of making a decision about who the best person is to fill a vacancy on the Supreme Court. And, um, you know, it's interesting that you cite the op-ed uh, because the op-ed was written by two individuals who actually voted to confirm the last nominee to the Supreme Court who was put up for a confirmation vote during a presidential election year. So they know firsthand, based on their own voting record, that there is a clear precedent here. And in fact, what that Senate did is it was actually run by Democrats. Both Senator Grassley and Senator McConnell at the time were in the minority. But what you saw Senate Democrats do is act on the nominee that was put forward by the president in the other party. And they held that vote in a presidential election year. That was their constitutional responsibility. It was, cons it was President Reagan's constitutional duty to put forward a nominee. And it was the constitutional duty of the United States Senate to give that nominee a fair hearing and a timely yes or no vote. Uh, that's precisely what uh, the Senate did in 1988. Uh, Senators Grassley and McConnell had their own role in that, uh, and we would expect them to do the same thing this time. What more can you tell us about what transpired on those phone calls that mm -hmm. you just mentioned? Uh, did, was the President able to get any sense from congressional leaders that um, if he were to nominate certain candidates of certain ideological flavor that he might be able to get a vote to confirm them? Well, uh, Josh, I do want to uh, give the President the ability to have, uh, uh, to consult privately, uh, even if we uh, describe to you uh, what that pro consultation process looks like. Uh, I can tell you that you know in those uh, those telephone calls that you know, they were entirely um, uh, professional and that there was an opportunity for the president to make clear that he is going to nominate someone. The president made clear that he is committed to consulting with Congress uh, as he decides who that nominee should be, and the president made clear that he's doing so doing all of this because he believes he has a constitutional duty to do so. Uh, and he reiterated his firm belief that the Senate has a constitutional uh, obligation here as well. Uh, I wanted to ask you also about the uh, U.S. airstrikes overnight in uh, mm -hmm. Libya. Uh, was this uh, kind of a one-off going after a high-level target similar to what we saw uh, in Libya late last year, um, or should we be looking at this as the start of a stepped-up military effort in Libya? Mm -hmm. uh, Josh, let's do the details first. Uh, I can confirm for you uh, that uh, early this morning, uh, the United States military conducted an airstrike in Libya targeting both an ISIL training camp near Sabratha and a specific leading ISIL figure uh, named Nuruddin Shushan. Uh, this individual uh, is a known ISIL leader, a facilitator and uh, an individual who has facilitated the flow of foreign terrorist fighters across North Africa. 
Uh, this individual is also wanted because of the role that he played uh, in carrying out the terrorist, uh, a terrorist attack uh, almost a year ago, in March of 2015, in Tunis, uh, killing uh, a number of tourists at the Bardot Museum in Tunis. Um, we, at this point, uh, cannot confirm the results uh, of the operation, uh, but I do think it is legitimate for you to uh, connect this operation with the operation that U.S. military forces carried out back in November. Um, back in November, U.S. military forces carried out a strike against the leading ISIL figure uh, in Libya, Abu Nabil. Uh, we have concluded that that strike was successful. Uh, and uh, both of these military strikes are an indication uh, that the President will make good on his promise to continue to apply pressure to ISIL leaders who threaten the United States and our interests. Uh, and this does demonstrate uh, the important capabilities that the United States has, including in Libya. Uh, and it's an indication that the President will not hesitate to take these kinds of forceful, decisive actions to ensure uh, the safety and security of the American people. Uh, and obviously, uh, today is uh, one additional occasion for us uh, to uh, pay tribute to the courage, service, professionalism, and expertise of the men and women who serve in the United States military. Here we have a tangible example of how uh, their service to the country uh, makes all of us safer. And lastly, uh, Senator Sanders, uh, in a BET interview that's going to be airing, uh, suggested that the reason that Hillary Clinton is uh, wrapping herself in the Obama legacy so much uh, is because she's going after African-American voters in particular. Um, the Clinton campaign has taken some issue with that. Does the President consider that to be uh, uh, an appropriate assessment of what Clinton is doing? Well, I guess for an, a good assessment of the Clinton campaign strategy, you should check with the Clinton campaign, and it sounds like you might have done that already. I, I think there are a couple of, uh, of facts that I would point out. Uh, the first is, uh, you know, Senator Sanders uh, stood not too far away from st stood not too far away from where I'm standing. You can just peek out the window and sort of see the spot where he was standing, where he uh, spoke to all of you after having spent an hour with the President of the United States in the Oval Office, where he talked to all of you about how proud he was of the progress our country has made under President Obama's leadership, um, and. I think that was a pretty strong uh, statement about how supportive uh, and proud Senator Sanders is of uh, President Obama's legacy. And that certainly is consistent with the kinds of comments that we've heard from Secretary Clinton. Both candidates were making those kinds of statements in advance of the Iowa caucuses. Uh, and based on even my own personal experience there, I know the proportion of African American voters in the Iowa caucuses is uh, not particularly high. So I, I suspect that um, um, those kinds of comments uh, from both candidates is an indication that, A, that they um, share President Obama's priorities and values when it comes to the direction of the country. Uh, both of them have played their unique role uh, in supporting the President. Uh, in advancing those values and priorities. Obviously, Senator Sanders, in a, uh, on a range of legislative priorities, has been supportive of the President's legislative agenda in an important way. And obviously, Secretary Clinton had a role as the Secretary of State in the Obama administration to advance the President's foreign policy vision around the world. So uh, you know, both of them have their own unique perspective here, but uh, I think both of them are making this case about the progress that we've made over the last seven years under President Obama's leadership, both to illustrate where it is they stand on the issues, but also to uh, make a case to voters, especially Democratic voters, that they're prepared to build on the progress that we've made so far. Thanks. Okay. Roberta. Um, the op-ed that was written by Leader McConnell and Senator Grassley mm -hmm. ran around 8 p.m. last night. And I'm wondering if you could say whether the President spoke to them after, whether they talked about the issues that the two senators have brought up in their op-ed? Uh, I can tell you that uh, President Obama had the opportunity to connect with uh, Leader McConnell uh, earlier in the day yesterday than 8 o'clock. 
uh, and he spoke to uh, Senator Grassley just this morning. They tried to connect yesterday, but were able to connect today. Uh, Again, I don't have a lot of details to share with you about the substance of their conversation, but I wouldn't be surprised if, uh, uh, if those kinds of issues came up. You can check, up, you can check with uh, uh, the two senators' office to confirm what they raised. And yesterday, uh, Vice President Biden um, did an interview with Rachel Maddow, and he described how uh, President Reagan had called him into the Oval Office and, and went through a list of candidates that he was considering. And um, then Senator Biden gave his opinions on which ones he thought were possible for the Senate to confirm. And um, uh, Senator, um, Vice President said that he thought President Obama should do that with Senator Grassley, sit down with him and go through a list. I'm wondering if you can say whether that's something that the President would be interested or, or open to doing or committed to doing. Well, I, um, I think I would say generally that what's notable about the difference in these two situations that uh, the Vice President described is that Vice President Biden, then Chairman of the Judiciary Committee, Joe Biden, didn't automatically object to the President's commitment to appointing somebody to fill a vacancy on the Supreme Court. So it would be a little odd at this stage, at least, to have an in-depth conversation about which nominees could be confirmed in the Senate with a senator who is suggesting that they won't consider any nominee. So it, it's difficult to determine exactly what that conversation would be like. But I think as evidenced by the president's telephone call, the president's committed to trying to find some common ground uh, with Republicans and to continue to make our case about the, con about the constitutional obligation uh, that the president has and the duty that he's prepared to fulfill. So if Senator Grassley showed an openness to having, possibly having a hearing, then the President might talk to him a little bit more about the candidates he might have in mind. Well, I, again, what, I think what I'm saying is even though Senator Grassley has indicated that he won't support anybody that the President puts forward, the President takes seriously the obligation that he has to uh, consult with the United States Senate. Uh, I will, uh, I, I also want to assure you that the President's consultations as he considers this decision will not just be limited to sitting members of the United States Senate. Uh, and as the President uh, has more of those meetings and conversations, uh, we'll do our best to let you know about those as well. Uh, but certainly, starting with the two leaders of the Senate and the two leaders of the Judiciary Committee uh, is an appropriate way to begin the conversation about uh, both the President and the United States Senate fulfilling their constitutional duties. But it's fair to say that in his conversations, he didn't run through any names that he was considering. I'm not going to get into the details of, uh, of their conversations. I wouldn't rule out uh, a discussion about particular nominees. Um, but I just would say that uh, the President is serious about robust consultation with Democrats and Republicans uh, in the United States Senate. Uh, those kinds of conversations will continue. And, uh, you know, there's no reason that this necessarily even has to be the last conversation that the President has with Chairman Grassley before he chooses a nominee. I suspect it won't be. Um, but I do suspect that as long as the chairman of the Judiciary Committee says that he won't consider anybody that the President puts forward, that that will at least limit the productiveness of those conversations. Okay. Bill. So you indicated, I think, that normally it's been about a month. And I'm wondering if you received any indication from the President about the length of time he might want to take before he puts forth a nominee in this case. Mm -hmm. uh, Bill, I, I have observed that both uh, uh, in filling the vacancies that were left by the retirements of Justices Souter and Stevens, that the President appointed uh, uh, or nominated a replacement um, within four or five weeks. Um, I don't have a different timeline to lay out, uh, but I think that gives you an indication of the amount of time that is required uh, to conduct a detailed search uh, and to do the, uh, uh, the vetting that is necessary uh, to determine uh, who the best person for the job is. Has the President um, mentioned any kind of timetable to you? Uh, not one that I'm prepared to share here publicly. Oh, come on. <laughs> but we'll try to keep you apprised of the process as it moves forward. I mean, I guess another thing that I can tell you is that the President's team over the course of this week uh, has spent uh, a lot of time preparing materials for the President's review. And I would expect uh, over the weekend 
that the president will begin to dig in to the materials that have been prepared for him by his team. Uh, these are materials related to some potential uh, nominees. This would include information about these individuals' uh, record, about their professional career and their professional experience, uh, all of which they would bring to um, a lifetime appointment to the Supreme Court. And um, there are, uh, as you know, a large number of lawyers who work at the White House, and they've uh, produced a significant quantity of information. Uh, and I suspect the President will be dedicating a significant portion of his weekend uh, digging into that information. Okay. Ron. Just to follow up on that, um, at the end of his conversations with Senator Grassley, is it still your feeling that they are not going to look at anyone, that they, that they will not consider a nominee, or did he back away from that position mm -hmm. in his discussion with the President? Well, I'll, I'll let uh, Senator Grassley characterize uh, his position and characterize what he represented to the President of the United States. Um, the President was clear about representing his view that the President has a constitutional duty to nominate a successor whenever there's a vacancy on the Supreme Court, and the Senate has a solemn constitutional duty to give that person a uh, fair hearing and a timely yes or no vote. Beyond the, 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 uh, excuse me, beyond the constitutional argument, and mm -hmm. when the President talked about this the other day, he said something about how it's because it's the Supreme Court, this is the time when we should rise above partisanship, we being, of course, the Senate. Um, <clears throat> does the President think that he has some political leverage here as well? In terms of, would you be go so far as to say that if the, if the Republicans don't fulfill their responsibility as he sees it, that there would be some political consequence out there in the country? Yeah. Well, I, I think it's hard, it's too hard at this point to assess exactly what sort of, what the political consequences are. Knowing the day and age in which we live and the fact that it is, in fact, a presidential election year, I'm confident that there will be a robust political debate uh, around this process. And I'm not suggesting that that somehow is illegitimate. What I am suggesting, however, is that the constitutional duties of the President and of the United States Senate should come before any sort of political considerations. That point, certainly will be the President's approach to this, and hopefully that will be the approach the Senate takes as well. Polls notwithstanding, <coughs> at this point, is the, is, is, is the President's sense of the nation that, that he thinks that, that the public supports him in this? Therefore, particularly in these places where there are close races and purple states, that there yeah. could be consequences for those yeah. uh, senators who don't play ball? Well, look, I, uh, uh, that's hard to assess. You guys all have uh, uh, polling units that you dedicate significant resources to, and I suspect you'll be uh, evaluating this question. Um, uh, you know, it's, I'm, I'm not suggesting that those polls are somehow irrelevant, but um, I think it's too soon to tell exactly sort of how the argument is resonating. I think what has been interesting to me is that we've seen a number of uh, unlikely figures uh, indicate that they share the President's view about the constitutional uh, responsibilities that are before both this President and the United States Senate. We saw the comments of former Supreme Court Justice Sandra Day O'Connor uh, indicate that she believed that the Senate should get on with it. Um, that was a pretty, uh, that was her unvarnished assessment, uh, and uh, it certainly is uh, consistent with the sentiment uh, that we have expressed about the President's constitutional responsibility. Uh, I would note that the, that, the, that the individual who served as the Attorney General under President George W. Bush uh, indicated his view that, quote, there's just no question in my mind that as President of the United States, you have an obligation to fill a vacancy. Uh, that's a, that's a, you know, precisely the case that we have made as well. So. I guess what I would say is that it's too soon to tell whether or not the argument that we're making is, uh, you know, is resonating uh, with the electorate, uh, but it does seem to me that the argument that we're making is at least consistent with some Republicans who know quite a bit about the law. I'm surprised that you would say that if you, you're, you have some doubts about whether it's, you didn't use the word doubts, yeah. but it's too soon. I mean, I, isn't this an obvious argument that the public should certainly rally around? Or, or why, why is there some doubt, doubt in your mind, perhaps yes. it's a strong word, but why, why are you stopping short of, of being so certain that, in fact? Well, I, I guess because I don't want to be in a position where I, um, you know, make a, make a claim that I can't uh, uh, 
back up. You want to be wrong. Well, <laughs> I, I don't think it's that I want to be wrong. I, I will actually say this. I don't have doubt uh, about the fact that I think most people uh, who take a look at this situation, I think, draw on maybe not legal expertise, but common sense in concluding that when there's a vacancy on the Supreme Court, that the president has a responsibility to nominate, a, uh, nominate someone to fill it, and the Senate has a responsibility to uh, give that person a, a fair hearing and a timely yes or no vote. Look, the other, I think the other thing that is uh, relevant here is, uh, is the precedent. And I'm not just referring to uh, Justice Kennedy's uh, confirmation vote that occurred in 1988, a presidential election year. Um, I think that is relevant. But what's also relevant is the way that uh, Supreme Court vacancies have been handled in the past. Uh, in the last 40 years, there's never been a vacancy that has had an impact on two different terms. But yet, that's precisely what would happen uh, if the Senate uh, follows through on the threats that uh, Senator McConnell has made to not even consider the President's nominee. It would be more than a year, uh, and it would have an impact uh, not just on the current Supreme Court term, but on the next term uh, that begins in October. And when you consider the important stakes uh, of the kinds of questions that the Supreme Court will be wrestling with, in the President's view, the Supreme Court should function as our founding fathers intended. Uh, and that means with uh, nine justices. And just lastly, um, this afternoon, um, when the President attends the services for Justice Scalia, what, what can we expect uh, to see? What's, what's, what's that going to look like? What, um, any more detail about what, what's going to happen? Well, I, I've seen a little bit of the television coverage that, uh, uh, of the events that have already taken place uh, at the Supreme Court today. It's a, it's a solemn event. And the country is marking the passing of, a, uh, of an influential figure in American life and in American uh, jurisprudence. And uh, you know, over the course of the day, thousands of Americans uh, will have an opportunity to pay their respects to Justice Scalia as he uh, lies in repose in the Great Hall of the Supreme Court. And the President and First Lady will be just among uh, the thousands of people doing the same thing. And I, the President doesn't plan to make any remarks or anything. Uh, obviously, he will just be there to um, you know, uh, offer up his own uh, condolences uh, to the family and to all of those who love Justice Scalia. Uh, you know, Justice Scalia had a large family. He had nine, nine children and uh, a couple dozen grandchildren at least. And uh, they're obviously mourning his death in a very personal way. Uh, so this is an opportunity for the President to both pay his personal respects to those who love Justice Scalia, but also pay tribute to the outsized impact uh, that he had on our country and on our legal system. Uh, the President believes that is worthy uh, of respect, and that's why both the President and First Lady uh, will be traveling to the Supreme Court this afternoon. Okay, Kevin. Thanks, Josh. Uh, did the President uh, get word of Arthur Lee's passing? And uh, does he have any uh, reaction to the passing of uh, a literary giant, winner of the Pulitzer Prize, and uh, or to kill a mockingbird? Yeah, I, uh, I I did not ask the president about this uh, uh, today, so I don't know if um, uh, if he was aware. Uh, but obviously, you know, his uh, um, you know, the president has talked publicly before about uh, how much respect uh, he had for Harper Lee, and you know, obviously, she was a giant uh, of American literature and. Um, you know, wrote, uh, you know, wrote *To Kill a Mockingbird*, a, a book that I think all of us can remember having read in school. And um, uh, you know, obviously, the uh, uh, she she had her own significant impact uh, on our country and our culture and uh, and our and in our country's perspective on some pretty sensitive topics. Uh, but she had a way of of uh, of telling stories that uh, does have an influence and resonates with uh, the worldview of so many Americans, uh, even so many decades after that book was initially published. If I could ask you about the High Court, and I know that the process is, is still ongoing, yeah. is there any doubt in your mind that the President would also consider the Attorney General? And if so, what sort of complications would that pose were he to nominate her? Uh, Kevin, at this point, I, I don't want to comment on any uh, sort of speculation about who the President may appoint, uh, but uh, let me do try to provide some insight that could be helpful to you. Uh, the last time there was a vacancy on the Supreme Court uh, was after uh, Justice Stevens uh, announced his intent to retire. 
and the president selected uh, Elena Kagan uh, to be his nominee to fill that vacancy. She was confirmed by the Senate uh, with bipartisan support. But uh, Justice Kagan at the time had uh, an important role in America's legal system. She was a solicitor general. So she was representing the United States government uh, before the Supreme Court on a, on a regular basis. And um, I guess the, the point that I'm making is that um, she was able to have her uh, deputy step up and fulfill some important functions as she was going through the process. Uh, what's also true is there were a handful of cases that she did have to recuse herself from uh, because of her previous involvement with them as Solicitor General. Uh, so um, I guess the point is uh, it matters uh, if a nominee is someone who is already playing a role, an influential role in the justice system. Uh, but uh, even somebody who's as central to that process as a Solicitor General uh, did not prevent, did not present obstacles that were insurmountable. If I could just, I don't want to put too much of a point on this, but given the fact that the Attorney General has already been vetted and has already received bipartisan support and has been confirmed, would that not make the process easier for the President? Well, it's, it's hard to say uh, at this point. And again, I wouldn't want to speculate on the, on the, uh, uh, on the potential ramifications of uh, nominating one individual or another. But certainly all the things that you said are true. Uh, this, uh, Attorney General Lynch has served with distinction. She's somebody who did have strong bipartisan support when she was nominated for the Attorney General post. Both Democrats and Republicans in the Senate supported her nomination to that uh, job. And you know, she's only been serving for uh, nine months or so, but she has uh, served with distinction. OK. Justin. Um, I wanted to ask if you had any details on the call with President Erdogan today mm -hmm. and if you had made a determination on the terror attack and if there were any policy changes on aid to the Kurdish PYD that you might have coming out of the, those. Mm -hmm. We will be uh, working on a more formal uh, readout of the call a little later today, Justin. The, but I can confirm for you that uh, President Obama did telephone President Erdogan uh, earlier today. The chief goal of the call was uh, so the President could offer his condolences for the February 17th terrorist attack in Ankara uh, and the terror attack that occurred a day later against a uh, Turkish military convoy um, in Diyarbakir province. The conversation between uh, uh, the two leaders did talk about uh, the situation uh, in Syria. And I, I think the thing that's notable uh, is that had you asked me this question a year ago, your question would have been focused on, rightfully so, why the Turks weren't helping at all uh, in our ongoing efforts to fight ISIL inside of Syria. Uh, that they hadn't put forward the kind of resources that we would have liked to see. They hadn't committed to taking the steps along the uh, Turkey-Syria border uh, that we believed were important to shutting down the flow of terror foreign terrorist fighters uh, into Syria. But over the course of the last year, substantial progress has been made. Over the course of the last year, Turkey did join our counter-ISIL coalition. They are making a substantial contribution to that effort. At the request of the United States, the Turkish government has taken important steps uh, to close off large sections of their border. There continue to be some sections where we'd like to see them do more. But there's no doubt that the steps that they have taken to secure their border uh, have reduced the flow of foreign fighters uh, to Syria. We know that uh, ISIL re relies on that flow of foreign fighters to replenish their ranks of fighters who were taken off the battlefield. Um, I, it's also relevant that the Turks have uh, relied on American expertise uh, in putting in place the security along their border. Uh, Turkey has also uh, demonstrated a commitment to working with the U.S. military and allowed U.S. military asset, assets to use the airbase in Interlik to carry out strikes against ISIL targets in Syria. This made it much more efficient uh, for U.S. military pilots uh, and even unmanned aircraft uh, to take strikes inside of Syria. The flight uh, from Interlik to Syria is much shorter. Uh, and that was a big benefit uh, and a, an important way that Turkey can help in this fight. And that is uh, a step that they have taken uh, just in the last few months. The other thing that has long been true uh, is that Turkey is bearing a significant burden when it comes to providing for uh, Syrian refugees who are fleeing violence in their own country. 
Uh, and they have been extraordinarily generous uh, and focused on meeting the humanitarian needs of these migrants. The United States has also provided significant uh, humanitarian support, more than any other country, to all of the countries in the region, including Turkey, that are uh, providing uh, this important assistance. You'll recall that uh, Turkey was pretty irritated uh, at the end of last year when there was a Russian fighter jet that they had said um, had flown into Turkish airspace. Uh, and you know, tensions between Turkey and Russia spiked. And while the United States certainly urged both sides to de-escalate, we made it quite clear that the United States stood shoulder to shoulder with our NATO ally in Turkey uh, against Russian provocations. Uh, and other inappropriate actions that were taken by uh, the Russian military. The engagement between senior U.S. officials and senior Turkish officials has been extensive. Uh, Vice President Biden was in Turkey uh, uh, just a month or so ago. Uh, and President Obama, on two different occasions within the span of uh, a couple of weeks last fall, met face to face with President Erdogan, both in Turkey and in Paris, when he was in Paris for the climate talks. So, uh, I say all of that to underscore that there is important progress that we have made over the last year in strengthening and solidifying the relationship between the United States and Turkey. Uh, and that has yielded important benefits for uh, both our countries, particularly in, in uh, enhancing uh, our effort to degrade and ultimately destroy uh, ISIL. Part of that effort, though, as you point out, uh, does include supporting a variety of forces uh, on the ground. Uh, who are taking the fight to ISIL in their own country. Uh, we certainly believe that's a critical part of the effort, and uh, we're going to continue to do that. Uh, did you, were you able to come to a determination? I know you said you weren't yesterday, or who, who was responsible? Uh, we've, seen the, we've seen the claims of uh, responsibility, but uh, I can't verify uh, those claims at this point. Uh, obviously, the terrorist attack that occurred was uh, outrageous, uh, and one that we strongly condemn because there were um, a lot of innocent lives who were affected. Um, the Senate Intelligence Committee and some Republicans especially are, say they want to consider a bill that would penalize companies like Apple who didn't assist law enforcement in accessing encrypted devices. Hmm. Um, I'm wondering if you guys would support this kind of legislation, especially since I, I think this week has clouded your guys' position a little bit on uh, encryption and whether the administration believes that U.S. companies should be able to ins to sell, you know, devices that that remain encrypted no matter what. Yeah. Well, uh, let me do my best to try to uh, clarify that position for you then, because I, I, w the steps that were taken by the independent investigators at the FBI, uh, you know, are consistent with a, with uh, the view that we've expressed from here uh, on many occasions, which is the president does believe that um, strong encryption is good. For, it's good for the U.S. economy. It's also good for protecting the civil liberties of uh, private American citizens. Uh, but at the same time, uh, we don't want to uh, allow terrorists to establish a safe haven in cyberspace. Uh, and the good news is that technology companies don't want to see them do the same thing. They're innocent people who lost their lives, patriotic American citizens who lost their lives in San Bernardino. And um, the President has made uh, that investigation uh, a top priority because he wants to make sure we can learn everything we possibly can about that situation so that we can take the steps that are needed to protect the country. Uh, and that's exactly what FBI investigators uh, are doing. Uh, and all of that is consistent not just with uh, our view of these complicated issues, but also consistent with the standard operating practice that the FBI has engaged in for quite some time now when investigating these kinds of matters. All right. Well, that didn't quite answer the question of whether you would be supportive of legislation that would penalize so companies I, I, when, there, when there are disagreements, yeah. like what yeah. we've seen in this exact case where Apple yeah. has said, you know, this is a slippery slope and, right. and this is... I'll uh, be honest, I haven't seen the, the legislation or been briefed on it, so it's hard for me to comment on it from here. Uh, if we do have a position, I'll let you know. One last one. Mm -hmm. um, since I know you enjoy bringing up Ted Cruz's birth almost as much as... Adam Zubin. Um, <laughs> uh, I thought you were going to say almost as much as Donald Trump. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, he, does judge, it, he does it far more often than I do. Yeah, a judge in the president's hometown has agreed uh, to hear a lawsuit uh, about his eligibility to be president. So I'm wondering if yeah. you guys have any comment on that. Yeah. 
Well, it's funny you should ask. I was actually up uh, really late last night preparing my amicus brief in that case. <laughs> so I don't know if that makes me eligible for a Supreme Court appointment or not. But, uh, no. but, uh, but look, uh, you know, obviously this is, uh, this is something that will work its way through the court system. The concern that we have with uh, uh, Senator Cruz's uh, um, record uh, and uh, is not, you know, questions that have been raised about his uh, birthplace or his eligibility to serve as president, but rather uh, about the kinds of values and priorities that he would bring to the job. Uh, they stand in quite stark contrast to the uh, kinds of priorities that this president has championed. All right. Michelle. Um, on the calls that were made in the last couple mm -hmm. hours to Senate leadership, um, I know you don't want to give a, a specific detail about what was said, but um, can you tell us about how long they talked and to whom did the mm -hmm. president speak the longest? Mm -hmm. Uh, I don't have uh, the sort of that granular material about uh, how long they spoke. Uh, I don't think these were particularly lengthy conversations, but uh, they certainly did provide the president ample time to have a, a discussion with uh, leaders in the United States Senate in both parties about the constitutional obligation that they have to give the president's nominee a, a, a fair hearing and a timely yes or no vote. And, Look, yesterday was the 28th anniversary of Justice Kennedy being sworn in as a Supreme Court justice. 28 years ago, we can all do the math, was a presidential election year. Both Senator Grassley and Senator McConnell supported his nomination and voted in that election year to confirm the Republican president's nominee to the Supreme Court. And we're asking them to, do, to just do the same thing. So very generally, um, how would you characterize the tone of those conversations? And mm -hmm. do you feel like there was any glimmer of progress or positivity about mm -hmm. those conversations? Well, I, I think those were, uh, I think the conversations were, uh, I think as you would expect, expect, were respectful and professional. And, uh, you know, the president had the opportunity to lay out his case about why he believes uh, this constitutional duty is so important. But look, the, that information is not new to well, four different individuals who spent a lot of time playing the, fulfilling the Senate's constitutional duty to offer advice and consent on the President's Supreme Court nominees. So that information isn't necessarily new to them, uh, but it is an opportunity for the President to begin a dialogue uh, about how this process should work, about how the President uh, intends to approach it. And the, the President's approach will be characterized by frequent uh, consultation, not just with uh, Democrats and Republicans in the Senate, uh, but uh, a variety of voices and individuals that have a, a perspective on a nomination that uh, is this important. So you mentioned all the materials that the President will be looking at mm -hmm. this weekend. So does that mean that the short list is complete? Is this everybody that he's considering at this point? Uh, thank you for asking that question. It is not. Uh, the President does not have a short list and the list has not been completed. Uh, this actually is the very beginning of the process. and. Um, but this is an opportunity for the President to dig into the materials that his team has prepared for him. Uh, this includes biographical information, uh, information about the public record uh, of individuals who may be worthy of consideration. Um, so I, I, again, as I sort of jokingly uh, acknowledged earlier, a substantial amount of information has been prepared, and I, I would expect that the President will spend uh, a significant portion of his weekend digging into those materials. So how many people are we talking about in this group then? Are we talking about five, ten, two? Uh, I, I, I don't have a, a, a number to share with you. It certainly is more than two. This is not, the, this is not a short list. Uh, this is the beginning of a process to evaluate uh, a number of individuals uh, for uh, consideration for a nomination. So it would be safe to say that the, the material that he has concerns several individuals. Would that be accurate? Um, I, 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 the, the number is greater than two. Okay. <laughs> I, guess that, I guess that means several. Okay, and given, given the climate now that is obvious and the kinds of conversations that the President has started having and all the debate that's going on ahead of time, is it safe to say that at this point we could rule out that he presents a nominee that could be seen as liberal or that's likely to be seen as liberal? Well, I, um, at this point I'm not going to speculate about how the President's nominee will be judged. Our expectation is that the President's nominee, when uh, the President puts that individual forward, that that nominee should be evaluated on the merits, that that individual's qualifications and experiences uh, should be evaluated uh, both by the American people, 
but also by the 100 members of the United States Senate that have taken an oath to fulfill their constitutional duty uh, to do their jobs. Uh, and um, that's what we expect that they will do, and we expect that that would entail uh, both a, a, a fair hearing and a timely up or down vote. So you wouldn't say at this point that this nominee needs to be a moderate? I, would, I, I think I would rely on the, the President's description, where he said that this individual, this nominee that he chooses, would be somebody whose qualifications were uh, indisputable. Thanks, okay. Judge. All right. Juliet. Just to follow up on that, mm -hmm. Vice President Biden, in a few different interviews yesterday, specifically said that the President should be looking for, uh, in his words, consensus candidate, someone who would be distinct from, say, former Justice Brennan, because he needs to win Republican votes. So the way the Vice President framed it, there was an allusion to maybe not the specific liberal moderate, but this idea that it has to be someone of a political bent that it would win significant Republican support. Yeah. Is that, would you describe that as an accurate description of the President's mindset, and could you elaborate on yeah. that? Well, uh, there are a number of things that come to mind. The, the first is that the President has already put forward two Supreme Court nominees who were confirmed in bipartisan fashion by the United States Senate. Uh, both Justice Sotomayor and Justice Kagan got important support from Republicans. Now, at the time, that support was less uh, critical uh, because Democrats were in the majority in the United States Senate. Uh, the same, uh, the situation is different now. And um, I guess my point is this. Even when the President didn't have to necessarily put forward someone who deserved bipartisan support, that's exactly what he did. In this case, since Republicans are in the majority, we know that, they, that the President's nominee will need bipartisan support, and that's what we expect uh, that they will deserve, and here's why, and I think this is the second thing that I think is important. The criteria that senators use when evaluating presidential nominees to the court is not evaluating whether or not they would have picked this person. The responsibility is to evaluate whether or not this is an individual who can serve the country with honor and distinction in a lifetime appointment to the Supreme Court. That is a substantial responsibility that the President is suggesting that this individual should assume. And the Senate should evaluate whether or not that person, based on their qualifications, their temperament, their experience, their professionalism, whether or not they can handle it. And that's the question that's being asked of them. There are 100 different members of the United States Senate, and some of them know a whole lot about the Supreme Court and have spent decades working on these issues. Some of them are new. Even those in the same party, I'm confident that if you just did a poll, an open-ended questionnaire of the members of the Senate who they believe should be uh, nominated to fill the vacancy, I wouldn't be surprised if you got 100 different people uh, in response. That's why the question facing the Senate is different. It's the President's constitutional responsibility to name uh, a nominee, and it's the Senate's responsibility to evaluate that nominee, not based on the criteria of whether or not that's the person they would have chose, but based on the criteria of whether or not that individual can serve the country with honor and distinction on the Supreme Court for the rest of their lives. And uh, that's, the, that's the way that the, the, the process uh, has been laid out. That's the way the process has moved forward in the past. It certainly is consistent with what our founding fathers intended. Uh, and um, most importantly, that is a process that uh, both the President and the United States Senate have a constitutional duty to fulfill. Jordan. Thanks, Josh. I have a question about Zika funding. Uh, okay. The chairman of the Appropriations Committee, Hal Rogers, mm -hmm. wrote a letter to the White House saying, basically turning down your request for emergency funding, saying that Congress should use uh, funding for Ebola to fight and redirect that mm -hmm. toward fighting Zika. I know this is, this is an approach that you've rejected in the past, but yes. given opposition coming from Republicans now, are you willing to reconsider that at all? Yeah. Well, Jordan, I think I would start out by saying that the important work that the United States has done to fight Ebola and to protect the American people from Ebola 
uh, is not done. I recognize that, the, uh, that, that that disease has receded from the headlines. I think we're all pleased about that. But the important work that needs to be done to build up the public health infrastructure of countries overseas to make sure that uh, those outbreaks don't quickly spiral out of control. We've seen firsthand as recently as a little over a year ago how that can have direct consequences on the safety and well-being of the American people even if that outbreak occurs an ocean away. So it's critically important that we follow through uh, on those efforts. And it would be profoundly unwise to take money away from the ongoing effort that's needed to fight Ebola. Now, is there some funding that could be uh, taken away from, uh, that could be repurposed without undermining our efforts to fight Ebola? Yeah, there probably is. In fact, that's likely to be part of our request. But those funds, those resources, would not be sufficient to take on what we believe is a pretty serious threat from the Zika virus. We want to make sure that we're prepared. And we're hopeful that when we put forward a proposal, a specific proposal that's coming soon, uh, that the Senate and the House will be prepared to act on it quickly. There's no reason that something like keeping the American people safe from the Zika virus should be some sort of partisan fight. Uh, I think Democrats and Republicans uh, in Congress are interested in making sure that pregnant women and unborn children uh, in this country can be properly protected. Uh, and those are the stakes here. Uh, and this is a, a threat that the uh, administration takes quite seriously. Uh, and uh, we hope that uh, Democrats and Republicans in Congress will do the same thing. Do you have a timeline for putting that proposal mm -hmm. forward? Uh, I don't have a specific timeline to, uh, to share with you, but uh, it's coming soon. Okay. Andrew. Okay, thanks, Josh. Um, there's a gentleman called Albert Woodfox who's going to be released today after 42 or 43 years in solitary confinement. Um, given this is an issue that the President's discussed a number of times, I was wondering if you had a, a view on the utility of keeping someone in confinement for that long and whether the White House thinks that that's humane punishment. Mm -hmm. Andrew, I have to confess I'm not familiar with this specific case. Um, I can uh, tell you that the uh, president did uh, author an op-ed earlier this year that ran in the Washington Post where he laid out his views about the reforms that he believes should be implemented in our criminal justice system uh, to ensure that um, things like solitary confinement are used uh, appropriately and sparingly. Uh, scientists tell us that prolonged uh, incarceration in solitary confinement can have a debilitating and long-term impact on an individual's mental health. And if our ultimate goal of our criminal justice system uh, is to give people a second chance um, after they've paid their debt to society, we're basically setting them up to fail. If we don't take seriously uh, the long-term negative consequences of uh, prolonged solitary confinement, if I remember rightly, he was the president took action on um, solitary confinement with regards to juveniles and people with mental illness. Mm -hmm. um, did he not act on the broader issue because he thinks it's beyond the scope of his? executive bar, or is it coming further down the road in any justice reform? Well, what is true is that the kinds of uh, reforms that the President put forward are the kinds of reforms that could only be implemented in the federal prison system. Um, individual states who, uh, who in some cases maintain their own rather large criminal justice system will have to make their own policies. We're certainly hopeful that the federal policy serves as a template for law enforcement officials in uh, all 50 states to follow. Uh, we ho we're hopeful that they will, and we've begun consultations with them uh, about that. I would note that a number of the other reforms that the President put forward did relate to the way that uh, solitary confinement is used 
uh, by the adult uh, inmate population. Um, and it related to things like, even if you're in solitary confinement, that you have uh, more time to walk outside your cell. Uh, and that the amount of time, the amount of sustained time that an individual faces solitary confinement uh, is limited and carefully monitored. Um, but we can follow up with you on some more of the details. It's been, I have to admit, it's been a little while since I've reviewed uh, those specifics. Uh, but there certainly is a, a lot to, uh, uh, to consider here uh, in terms of the reforms that the President has proposed. Thanks. Okay. Mark. Joshua, the White House staff is point person on the nomination search. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, Mark, I, I, don't, I don't have a new name to share with you at this point. Uh, obviously, the, okay. <laughs> <laughs> obviously the, the President's legal team at this point uh, has the most prominent role uh, in uh, helping him uh, prepare to make this weighty decision. Uh, so obviously the President's uh, um, counsel, uh, Neil Eggleston, uh, is playing a, a prominent role here. Uh, but Neil's got a whole team of, uh, of White House lawyers who uh, can provide the President the information and resources that he needs to uh, consider this decision. Uh, there will be other aspects of this that will uh, feature prominently as well if we're committed to uh, robust congressional consultation, uh, and we are. Uh, that may require some additional resources uh, to get that done. So uh, we'll keep you posted if, uh, uh, if we need to make any changes to our staff uh, in this regard. But, um, but right now the President is uh, being very well received uh, very well served uh, by his legal team that's led by Neil Eggleston. Are some of the materials left over from the Kagan search? Well, as I pointed out to, uh, to someone yesterday, uh, or maybe it was the day before, uh, the fact that somebody has been previously considered for a Supreme Court vacancy uh, does not disqualify them from being considered this time around, too. Um, it doesn't mean that everybody who was considered last time will also be considered this time. Uh, but um, I think more importantly, Mark, I actually think that the institutional experience that we have uh, in conducting uh, two successful uh, Supreme Court uh, nominations uh, of Justice Sotomayor and Justice Kagan uh, will certainly be valuable to us uh, as uh, we move forward with this process to fill the third vacancy. Do you know whether during the interim since uh, the Kagan nomination uh, those records have been updated um, that uh, counsel's office might say, oh, this is someone we ought to add to the uh, list in case we get another nomination. I, I, I'll be honest, I don't have a good sense about how that works. Uh, when the rest of us are, are, are not paying attention to the, uh, to the Supreme Court, what kind of work goes on behind the scenes to keep those records updated? Um, you know, I suspect that there is somebody that's thinking about that all the time. Um, but what's also true is that we, we've got significant resources uh, a lot of people with a lot of legal and even Supreme Court expertise here uh, that can uh, get up to speed quickly uh, and ensure that, uh, uh, that the President has the information that he needs to uh, begin to make this important decision. Does White House counsel know you're writing amicus briefs? <laughs> <laughs> That's a good question. I, I suspect that uh, if they said that they were writing press releases, I might be a little irritated. So let me just assure them and you that it was just a joke. Okay. Cheryl. Oh, no. I know. Probably for the first time ever, right? Ever. Yeah. Um, saying that the Senate, and you repeated it again today, saying that the right. Senate has a duty to vote on the President's nominee. And mm -hmm. they're pointing to a quote that Senator Reid um, said in 2005, that, that nowhere does the Constitution say or that the Senate has a duty to vote on presidential nominations. So do you, do you still believe that, or is that... To find a distinction. Yeah. I mean, the, the problem with this is that this process has been so subjected to politics that we could probably spend like 24 hours um, reading quotes back and forth when people are on different sides of this issue. Let's go. So, I, I, as appealing as that might be to Gardner, um, why don't I just try to limit myself to one? Okay? Uh, and it would just be from Senator Grassley, and I cite this one because it wasn't that long ago. This was July of 2008. Uh, Senator Grassley said, the reality is that the Senate has never stopped confirming judicial nominees during the last few months of a president's term. So the point is that if we dig into the rhetoric that's been uh, cast by both sides, um, it'll be more than a little confusing. 
I think that's why the President believes that what we should simply do is consider the requirements of the Constitution uh, and the long precedent that has been established by the United States Senate. The Constitution says that when there's a vacancy in the Supreme Court that the sitting President of the United States, who's filling a four-year term, not a three-year term, has a constitutional duty to nominate a successor. The Senate then has both the duty and the responsibility uh, of offering their advice and consent. Uh, and at least for everybody who's sitting on the Supreme Court right now, that meant a timely up or down vote uh, and a fair hearing. Uh, I, I guess the other relevant uh, piece of precedent here that I think is uh, notable is that since 1875, every single Supreme Court nominee that was put forward by the President of the United States has gotten a hearing. So now there are some exceptions to that where you had a president put forward a nominee and then withdraw them before the hearing began. But every time the president was calling on the Senate to hold a hearing on the Supreme Court nominee, every time since 1875, the Senate has fulfilled their constitutional duty. Uh, and we expect the, the Senate here in uh, 2016 to do the same thing. All right, Gardner. Uh, Josh, the Syrian ceasefire didn't happen, and is there a danger that the failure of diplomacy sort of across the Middle East will undermine any military gains the U.S. is able to secure against ISIS in Libya and Syria? Well, uh, Gardner, I think you're alluding to a principle that we have applied to this situation from the beginning, which is simply that the situation inside of Syria doesn't have a military solution. There's no military solution that can be applied in Syria to solve all the problems plaguing that country. What we can do, using the expertise, courage, and might of the United States military uh, and our 65 counter-ISIL coalition partners, is use our military to put enormous pressure on ISIL's leadership. We can use our military to begin to roll back territorial gains that ISIL had made. We can use our military to conduct raids and exploit treasure troves of intelligence that would allow us to take steps to further degrade and destroy uh, ISIL. We can even use our military might, as has been publicized over the last uh, few weeks, to reduce ISIL's stockpile of cash. Uh, in some ways, that's a, a, a particularly good illustration of our ISIL counterfinance efforts being seamlessly integrated into the efforts of uh, our military coalition partners. Would you want to take an aside about someone who was nominated to work on ISIL? <laughs> well, I certainly could, because it does under underscore uh, how uh, the expertise of Adam Zubin can advance uh, the success of not just our broad counter-ISIL coalition, but even uh, our military efforts. This is part of a drinking game. For <laughs> there you go. Yeah. There you go. Well, wait till after the briefing before you take your yeah. drink. Um, so, uh, so I, I think you're, you're highlighting something that is, uh, uh, is entirely consistent with what our approach has been, which is that we need to find a political solution inside of Syria to address the problems that are having such significant consequences around the world. Uh, and that's why um, Secretary Kerry has been so focused on this effort. And it's why, despite the significant number of obstacles that he has faced, he continues to pursue it. Uh, and it's not just because he's particularly tenacious, which he is. Uh, it's not just because he uh, enjoys uh, talking to his Russian counterparts so often, although presumably sometimes they have a pleasant conversation. I think most of the time they don't. But he's doing this because he understands that this is fundamental to ending the violence in Syria and addressing the wide array of problems that have been caused by the political dysfunction inside of Syria that actually do have grave consequences for American national security. Josh, you recently obviously had uh, 
a military operation in Libya, a bombing operation that, that seemed to be successful. Can you talk a little bit about this balance between diplomacy and, and military operations, yeah. not just in Syria, but also in Libya? Right. Because it does seem that your diplomatic options in Libya are even more limited than your ones in Syria. Mm -hmm. Well, this is a, this is a good example. Um, let me just take this one, back one step farther, because it's pretty clear what ISIL's strategy is. They look for countries where they can exploit political chaos to establish a foothold. That's what they did inside of Syria, where they started. President Assad began losing his grip on power. He began using the military might of the Syrian nation to attack the citizens of Syria. It caused great turmoil. Uh, and he lost control of the country. And ISIL capitalized that, set up a toehold uh, inside of Syria. They then spread into Iraq, and we had seen a central government in Iraq that had governed that country along sectarian lines for too long uh, and exposed an alarming weakness in the Iraqi security forces. Uh, and ISIL uh, moved in to set up shop there. Now, there's been a change in the central government inside of Iraq. There is a new prime minister. Uh, who has been uh, working to unite that country and to govern in a way that reflects Iraq's diversity. And that's why uh, that certainly has contributed to the success that Iraq has had uh, in taking back significant uh, territory uh, that ISIL had uh, previously taken. So uh, the reason I'm walking through all of this is that ISIL is trying to do the same thing in Libya. Libya is another nation that is plagued by political turmoil. And they're trying to capitalize on that turmoil and chaos to establish a, a foothold uh, inside of Libya. So the kind of approach the United States has taken to both advancing the uh, diplomatic and political track uh, uh, alongside our military efforts, we're doing the same thing in, inside of Libya. The good news is that in Libya, they actually are making some long sought progress, uh, that there is a, uh, uh, that many political leaders inside of Libya are finalizing the government of national accord, uh, which is uh, an essential step toward providing the Libyan people the opportunity to rebuild their country. Uh, and the UN has facilitated that process. The United States has been strongly supportive uh, of it. Uh, there's a, a US envoy that has been dedicated to uh, trying to advance that process, and we certainly have been pleased with the steps that they've taken thus far. What will be important uh, is uh, for that uh, central government to uh, be formed, uh, to take up residence in Tripoli, and to begin providing for the security situation uh, inside of Libya. But until the time that they can do that, uh, you know, the United States may have to take out, uh, to carry out actions like we did overnight to protect the American people and to protect our interests in the region. Um, and so we're going to be prepared to do that even as we continue to be strongly supportive of the political process inside of Libya. Thanks, okay. Josh. Devin. Josh, I want to ask you about a couple of storylines bubbling on the Democratic side of the campaign. Um, first one, uh, the Vice President yesterday in one of his interviews, I think the Post, sort of gave a critique of Hillary Clinton and Bernie Sanders. Uh, for downplaying the economic recovery. He said that it's a big mistake, his words, big mistake, to not uh, more forcefully play up that uh, the recovery. Does the President think that, that it's a big mistake, that they aren't playing it up enough? Mm -hmm. Well, I think what is clear is that both uh, Secretary Clinton and Senator Sanders have very capable campaign teams who are designing uh, their campaign strategy. Uh, obviously, uh, both of the Democratic candidates have their own knowledge and experience of a wide range of economic policies. So they certainly are going to uh, be able to lead that process. Um, and we've heard both candidates articulate their view that the progress that has been made um, under President Obama's leadership over the last seven years uh, has been a little underappreciated. Uh, Secretary Clinton in particular often discusses how President Obama doesn't deserve the credit that he, or hasn't gotten the credit that he deserves uh, for digging us out of a terrible hole that was caused by the Great Recession. 
And one of the reasons that the president is quite confident that he will be enthusiastic about whoever is the Democratic nominee is that both Democratic candidates are vowing to build on the progress that we've made thus far. And all of the Republican candidates are making the case that we should actually go back to the policies that created the Great Recession. So you know, it's going to be pretty clear uh, what, what choice that the American people will face in the general election. So she doesn't necessarily share the vice president's view that right now it's not being adequately touted and promoted. Yeah. Well, I haven't asked the president this direct question, but uh, he certainly has noted uh, that, um, you know, that both candidates are vowing to build on the progress that we've made. Look, President Obama has also acknowledged that there's a lot of important work that remains to be done. Uh, that there's still more work that we can do to expand economic opportunity for the middle class. There's more work that we can do to put upward pressure uh, on wages. Uh, there's more that we can do to uh, help middle class families balance the uh, obligations that they have uh, at the office with the obligations that they have at home. There's obviously more that we can do to uh, deepen our country's economic ties with economies around the world. That, that will only serve to strengthen the U.S. economy uh, and make our economy stronger for the middle class. So. There's more important work that needs to be done, uh, and uh, the president certainly hasn't overlooked that. Uh, but given the given how important that work is, uh, that's the reason I think uh, uh, the president will be an enthusiastic supporter and advocate for uh, the presidential candidate that's vowing to build on this progress. And one more question uh, about Hillary Clinton: She gave an interview uh, to CBS <laughs> yesterday and was asked, um, "Have you always told the truth?" And she said. Wrote, I've always tried to. Um, and Republicans are pouncing on this, saying there's some wiggle room there. Uh, not to speak for her, but you know, on behalf of the president of her former boss, employer, I mean, do, do you have you know, an opinion or would you weigh in on, on her honesty and trustworthiness? I think uh, Secretary Clinton has a very strong case to make uh, about the kinds of ethics and values uh, and honesty uh, that she has brought to her long career public service. So I'll let her. Uh, uh, weigh in on uh, uh, in defending herself uh, against those charges. Okay. Uh, Patty, I want to give you the last one. We'll do the week ahead. Um, did the President ask President Erdogan to stop bombing the YPG? Well, what is uh, – I don't have a detailed readout of the, uh, of the call to share with you. Um, obviously, the strategy that we have pursued inside of Syria uh, has been to um, offer some support to uh, a variety of forces that have been fighting ISIL on the ground inside of Syria. Uh, the President's made clear that uh, we need uh, people in Syria who are fighting for their own country. Uh, and there are a variety of ways that we can support them, including carrying out airstrikes to support their efforts on the ground. But there are a variety of fighters, uh, some Syrian Arabs, some Turkmen fighters, and um, you know, we are uh, seeking to support those groups that are committed to fighting ISIL. That's our number one goal. And if there are organizations on the ground that we can count on who share that goal, uh, we're going to continue to support them. But did, he ask them did he ask the President to stop bombing them? Because I mean, it has to be have, have an impact on your campaign, no? Well, uh, again, I, for any impact on the campaign, I'd refer you to the, to the Department of Defense. But uh, look, we've been uh, quite clear that we are, um, you know, that we share the uh, concern that Turkey has about the political instability inside of Syria and about the presence of ISIL just across uh, the border from Turkey. Uh, Turkey is quite concerned about this as well. And as our NATO ally, uh, we're going to continue to work effectively with them to counter uh, that threat. Um, we've been pretty clear about what our strategy is, and there certainly are some additional asks that we have of the uh, of the Turks, that there's more work that they can do along their border. Uh, but we certainly have been appreciative of the kinds of steps that the Turks have taken to facilitate uh, an enhancement of our efforts against ISIL inside of Syria, including you know, access to the base at uh, Interlik and uh, more effectively closing other parts of the border that have shut down the flow of foreign fighters and you know, also providing for the basic humanitarian needs of millions of Syrians who are fleeing violence. Let's uh, do the week ahead, and then uh, you guys can get started on your weekend. On Monday, uh, the President will deliver remarks and take questions from the National Governors Association uh, here at the White House. Um, on Tuesday, the President will attend a DNC roundtable here in Washington, D.C. 
Uh, on Wednesday, the President will host His Majesty King Abdullah II of Jordan at the White House. Uh, the United States greatly values its enduring and strategic partnership uh, with Jordan, uh, as well as our shared initiatives on a broad range of diplomatic and security challenges. Uh, during their meeting, the President and, and King Abdullah will discuss efforts to counter ISIL, resolve the Syrian conflict, address the needs of Syrian and Iraqi refugees in Jordan, uh, and discuss how the United States can continue to support the Kingdom's generosity in hosting those refugees. Uh, the two leaders will also discuss uh, how Jordan uh, continues its political and economic reform initiatives. Uh, finally, they'll also discuss how best to advance prospects for a two-state solution to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and other areas of mutual interest. Uh, that'll be on Wednesday. Uh, Wednesday evening, uh, the President and First Lady will invite top contemporary artists to the White House as part of its In Performance at the White House series. Uh, the event will celebrate the iconic singer, songwriter, composer, and musician Ray Charles. Uh, on Thursday, the President will deliver remarks at an event on precision medicine that we'll be hosting here at the White House. Uh, and then on Friday, next Friday, the President will attend meetings at the White House. So with that, I hope you all have a great weekend.